There's always some sort of personal experience involved. And I think for me it had to do with having been active in the anti-war movement in the 1960s in this country. Uh, and then in the 1970s, following Watergate and the Church Committee and the introduction of the Freedom of, Infor Freedom of Information Act, uh, I was able to get my FBI files. Uh, and I found it fascinating and chilling just how closely uh, the FBI had been following me, who was a very small fish indeed in the anti-war movement in this country, but you know, there were about 150 pages of files, and you could see you know, what phones they were listening to, uh, what, acti or what activities they were tracking, and so on. So that is something that has made me always very sensitive to the whole issue of surveillance and its connection with power. Um, I think that previously the paradigm we've always had in our minds about privacy and surveillance has had to do with the image of a highly authoritarian state keeping track of its dissidents or its enemies. You know, the Soviet Union, which watched people in so many different ways, East Germany with Ustashi uh, accumulating vast amounts of, of information about uh, citizens throughout the country. Uh, and there are other countries at other times who have also mounted enormous surveillance operations. Um, sometimes this can be a gift to people who write history like me, even though it may be appalling to look at from a political point of view. Uh, I recently did a book that concerned the history of dissent against the uh, First World War. People who correctly, I think, perceived this war as a totally mad thing that was not worth fighting. And it is fascinating and chilling to see just how much we can find out about those dissenting movements through information accumulated by the FBI's predecessor in this country and by Scotland Yard and, uh, and military intelligence in Britain. 
Uh, you can look through people's correspondence. You can look through material confiscated from their offices when they were raided, all sorts of material like that. Um, we have had our own version of that here in this country. Uh, when J. Edgar Hoover was running the FBI, he was a person who would have liked to have seen the United States become an authoritarian state of sorts. And he accumulated, as is well known, a vast amount of information about people whom he considered his political enemies, or who were subversive, or who had politics uh, of one sort or another which he didn't like. And this was often used uh, to blackmail people, to blackmail politicians into continuing to appropriate large amounts of money for the FBI, for example. Uh, the article that uh, Sarah referred to that uh, I wrote uh, recently was a review in the New York Review of Books of a very important book by a California journalist named Seth Rosenfeld, who uh, over the course of two decades of repeated lawsuits uh, got 300,000 pages of FBI documents and uh, documented in great detail how the FBI had had it in for the University of California over a period of many years. Uh, Hoover in particular uh, didn't like the university's president in the 1950s and 1960s, Clark Kerr, who was actually quite a strong proponent of civil liberties. Uh, Hoover got totally upset when at one point there was a question on the university's entrance exam that appeared to be critical of the FBI, and he set 30 agents to work investigating the university and trying to figure out who had written this question on the entrance exam. Uh, he did surveillance on liberal members of the university's Board of Regents. Um, his agents wrote uh, poison pen letters. Uh, they in infiltrated agent provocateur into anti-war organizations, into student dissent organizations of various types. Now the thing is, all this has just been exposed in detail in the last few years as a result of these uh, documents obtained by many lawsuits through the, the Freedom of Information Act. We need to think in instances like that about how chilling it would have been for people at the time if they had known that they were under surveillance to this degree, if they had known that things that they said in meetings that they thought were private were in fact being recorded and ending up in government files. Uh, it's, it would have cast a chill over a period of political activity that we think of today, the 1960s, as being very free and easy. None of us back then had any idea just how closely we were being watched, listened to, spied on. We thought the only people spying on us were the FBI agents in trench coats. And indeed, they did wear trench coats that you could see sometimes hovering on the margins of anti-war demonstrations and the like. Uh, we didn't realize that we were also being spied on by people who were opening our mail and by people who had been infiltrated uh, into the organizations that we belong to. Now, of course, the whole paradigm has changed because technology has made it possible to do all these things, uh, for both for governments to do these things and for corporations to do these things, without having an agent in a trench coat, without even smuggling an agent provocateur into your community group or political organization. You can do just about all the spying you want electronically. And here, I think, the real danger is that technology uh, makes this so easy. It makes it so tempting. There is a sort of a natural human impulse when a tool is there to want to use it. There's a natural human impulse to persuade yourself when you're using some fancy new tool that you're doing it for some sort of good purpose. Suppose somebody magically gave you or me uh, the ability to automatically see with some kind of hidden camera what was going on 
in any room that we chose anywhere in the world? Well, we might think, well, this is rather unethical to use when the people being looked at don't know about it. But maybe I can use it for good purposes and see what, uh, you know, terrible shenanigans are being uh, plotted by this government or that government or this corporation. But before long, I bet we would find ourselves using it uh, to spy on enemies, on friends, uh, for all other sorts of purposes as well. Well, of course, our government has that ability with this technology, uh, <clears throat> not in necessarily insert cameras in rooms, but electronically to, you know, through our email, our Facebook postings, our text messages, and all the other electronic ways to communicate to uh, spy on people. And I think at the beginning, the rational, in, in this last phase, the rationale is, well, we're keeping an eye on people who are possibly planning the next September 11th type attacks. And we would all think, well, yeah, that probably has to be done. Then the rationale becomes, well, we're, we're spying on people who might be planning the next September 11th type attacks. And then, before long, they're listening in on Angela Merkel's cell phone, who is supposedly one of our best friends. Uh, and it's not just our government that does this. There have been extensive revelations in recent months about what the British government does, what the French government does, and we can only assume that the same is even more true of governments in other parts of the world that, uh, you know, where there isn't a press that is able to expose this kind of thing. And of course, beyond this, it's not just governments that have the ability to track our concerns about this, but corporations, which can track what we buy, they can offer us things to buy, they know what we're doing web searches about. Do we want that kind of knowledge out there for all of us, for sale to the highest bidder, whether that bidder is a government or a corporation? Even in the philanthropic sector, there are people who are clearly tempted by the things that this kind of ter technology offers. For example, the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, two years ago, put $1.4 million into grants to research what they call biometric bracelets which are things that students in schools would wear on their wrists in, classroom, in classrooms to measure the degree to which they're paying attention. Supposedly, this is to evaluate teachers. Well, it could be used to evaluate teachers, but you know, it can be used to evaluate all sorts of other things as well. And again, I would ask, do you want this kind of information about your son or daughter in school to be available to the highest bidder without your permission, without their permission. There are some high schools now that are trying to get students to wear ID badges with locator chips so they can tell where they are at every time, uh, every time during the day. Do you want, you know, if you were such a high school student, do you want, you know, the principal's office to know how many times a day you went to the bathroom, where you were at every time uh, of day, I don't think so. Um, and of course, it's often very hard to tell in situations like this where the good intentions of a philanthropist starts with and, and where a company's push to make money begins because there is a huge amount of money to be made by selling technologies like this to schools, corporations, foundations, and governments. So let me end up by just summarizing what, and I, what are the challenges that I think this kind of world faces us with, and I've just scraped the surface of describing it. Um, it's made me realize a couple of things. I think first, we have to be incredibly grateful to the whistleblowers who have allowed us to see the full scope of what's going on. Uh, if there were any justice in the world, I think Edward Snowden should get the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, he has done a remarkable service in disclosing this, this kind of information. And it's interesting to me to see 
how that is recognized more widely than you would expect. I came across a, uh, a wonderful reference to Stoughton the other day, uh, written by somebody named uh, Charles W. Freeman, former Assistant Secretary of Defense, lifelong Foreign Service Officer, former U.S. Ambassador to Saudi Arabia, who said that he felt that Snowden had committed the most important act of civil disobedience in 200 years of American history. And he said that as long as someone long in service to our country, I'm upset by such defiance of authority. But as an American, I am not upset. And he compared Snowden to, to Thoreau. Um, a couple of other points. I think that the legal institutions that we have um, to deal with these kind of uh, the threat to our privacy that surveillance poses are totally inadequate. The FISA court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, this is the court that the NSA is supposed to go to every time they want to get a, you know, they need a warrant to enlarge the scope of their spy. It's a total joke. First of all, the court virtually always gives the warrants that the NSA or other government intelligence agencies ask for. Secondly, the agencies sometimes go ahead and do the surveillance even if they don't get the warrant. Thirdly, the judges on this court are simply appointed by the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States with no further input, no Senate confirmation, nothing else from anybody. Now, we might think that's a particularly bad system because we don't like the current Chief Justice of the US, but whoever the Chief Justice is, you can't just have one person appointing the judges of such an important court with no checks and balances. This court also ought to have a permanent public defender's office that questions every one of those requests for a warrant and sticks up for the right of the public not to have surveillance of this sort imposed on it unless there is a very, very good reason. I think there are countless other ways in which we need protection of privacy uh, written into the laws, and I would start with a constitutional amendment on the subject, because I think technology has simply progressed so much farther than you know, human society was at at the time that the Bill of Rights was written. We really need to catch up legally speaking, with where we are technically speaking today. So I will stop there. Thanks so much, Adam. Um, I think what we'll do is maybe save those questions for the end. Um, Susanna, are you OK? Yeah, um, I wanted to take it down so it wasn't distracting while I was spoke, but now okay. it's all up. All right. Um, I'm Suzanne Moss. I'll just start. Um, um, I'm the executive director of Penn American Center. I'm going to share with you uh, a study that we did at the end of last year about the impact of surveillance on writers. And then uh, I hope we can talk about uh, all three of the short presentations uh, in a discussion afterwards. Um, this is just uh, uh, sort of a framing quote to give a uh, flavor of why it is that writers have a special stake in issues of surveillance. I think Adam has laid it out, and I think of it uh, this way, that writers really are those who uh, depend on free expression for their livelihood, for their craft, and there has always been, I think, a zone of privacy uh, and, and personhood that has enabled creativity to thrive. And we all enjoy it. It's, uh, you know, the way, what, the ability to sort of think and imagine in your head, to sketch, to jot down, to draft, to ruminate, uh, and the role that that process has in one's ability to generate creative output. Uh, in the case of, of both the person on my left and to my right, uh, seven books a piece. Um, and so I think the question we confront today is, uh, will that zone of freedom and creativity 
be able to survive and prosper amid the kinds of intrusive surveillance that we've now all learned pervade our daily life. And this is uh, just a, a quote from Anthony Appiah, uh, who is uh, talking about, in a society that lived through the abuses of state power against Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., we cannot think that we will only be in danger if we are in the wrong. I have sometimes thought myself, as I reflected on issues about the morality of terrorism and our responses to it, that I must censor myself in my most private writings because I cannot be sure that my writings will not be spied upon, misconstrued, used against me. And here's a man who uh, just left a, a prestigious endowed chair at Princeton for an even more prestigious and better endowed chair at NYU, uh, and yet nonetheless uh, feels a sense of vulnerability. This is just a short excerpt, uh, and I won't read the whole thing from Walter Bernstein. Walter Bernstein is the uh, last surviving member uh, or individual who was on the blacklist during the McCarthy era, so lived through this as a screenwriter. We interviewed him. I think he's about 96 years old. Uh, and, and he reflects here, I'll just read a very short excerpt about this, this question of whether one should be worried about surveillance. You know, the, the, the phrase you hear is, uh, you shouldn't be worried if you have nothing to hide. That uh, you know, if you're a law-abiding citizen, if you're kind of going about your private business in a normal way, then surveillance shouldn't really trouble you because you know what's what's going to be revealed um, about you. But what he says is, there's no such thing as them narrowing the focus, or that if you're law-abiding, you have nothing to fear. You have lots to fear from both the direct fact that they have you in their database, and that it's all a warning to you also. It doesn't matter whether you're law-abiding or not. We have the power and we have the information, and that's a terrible kind of climate to live in. And uh, you hear a couple of more uh, quotes from writers about surveillance. One of the things I've learned through repeat visits to another country with a strong police military presence is what it feels like not to know whether or exactly how you are being watched due to some categorization that you might not even know about. I'm going to move on in the interest of time. And just uh, one point of departure for Penn on these issues is if you think about well, why is it that we worry about surveillance or what do we worry about or what's in our imagination when we think about uh, a, a camera uh, or somebody tracking uh, our webcam or emails or social media circles. And much of what that evokes for us really comes from literature. It's from the great imaginations and nightmares of some of our most important literary writers, whether it's Kafka uh, or George Orwell or Aldous Huxley, uh, you know, those are the images that are conjured up, and they were conceived first in literature. So literature has always played the role of sounding the alarm bell and making vivid for us what really is at stake uh, when we talk about the zone of privacy. So let's fast forward to, uh, it's, it's not, uh, actually, it's, it's the date is wrong, it was 2013, but it was a Pew survey uh, last summer, and they asked ordinary Americans how they were responding to the, the first revelations from Edward Snowden, and the headline was, Majority Views NSA Phone Tracking as Acceptable Anti-Terror Tactic. Public says investigate terrorism even if it intrudes on privacy. And so, we read that, and uh, what we took away was sort of a lot of Americans were learning about uh, this, this intrusive surveillance, surveillance uh, with a scope and breadth that we had never before known about or dreamed about. Every, uh, the metadata for every single phone call and email uh, probes into social media circles. Uh, all these vast troves of data being intercepted even before internet companies or cable providers could be asked for them. The, the, the NSA just sucking it all in uh, itself without any warrant, without any notice, without uh, any transparency, uh, and only revealed because of the actions of this single individual whistleblower, Edward Snowden. And so most Americans, uh, nonetheless, despite all that, sort of seem to be kind of shrugging their shoulders. And we wanted to know how writers felt, whether writers who depend on free expression in a different way 
uh, were reacting in the same way? How were they being affected in their thinking, their research, and their writing? And you know, we sort of think of writers as, and it's, it's a phrase uh, that an E.L. Doctorow has used uh, to talk about this, as the canaries in the coal mine. If free expression is at risk or under threat, writers are going to experience that first. And so we did a survey uh, working with a respected polling firm to examine the impact of mass surveillance on US-based PEN members. Because we, we thought sort of in the public debate here, it might make more of an impression uh, for people that learned that American writers were concerned. We, 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 we had a sense already that some international writers were concerned. And, and Yana's going to talk more about that. So we surveyed 528 uh, American writers, we, and we asked them a series of questions about surveillance, whether they thought they'd been surveilled, and particularly whether they had taken any action in response. And we also left uh, space for people to comment in free form. Just a few of the key findings. We found, in contrast to the average American or the general public, 85% of writers responding to our survey were worried about government surveillance uh, of Americans. And most of them were, were, were said they were very worried. 73% said they had never been as worried about privacy rights and freedom of the press as they are today. And 66% of writers disapprove of government collection of telephone and internet data. And I'll, I'll show you uh, how this compares with the general public, we asked the exact same question that the Pew survey had found, which is uh, what are people's responses to the government's collection of telephone and internet data as part of anti-terrorism efforts. And whereas uh, that initial Pew survey said only 44% of the general public approved, 66% of writers uh, disapproved. So it was a pretty striking difference in the reaction uh, of writers as compared to the general public. Much deeper uh, awareness and, and, and much uh, greater concern. Our second key finding was an assumption by writers that their communications are now being monitored. So uh, this is a real sea change and shift uh, and almost the flicking of a switch uh, when there's Snowden revelations first emerged, uh, and, and, and writers told us they now assume that they are under surveillance, and also that they, this is making them hesitant. Uh, they're reluctant to speak about certain topics, reluctant to pursue research on certain subjects, and concerned or wary about communicating with sources or friends abroad for fear that those communications are being monitored and that there may be uh, danger as a result. More detail on uh, our, our central finding, and I think our you know, most surprising finding, which frankly we were, I, we were surprised about this. We weren't sure what this survey was going to reveal. We even asked people um, when it came to self-censorship, we asked not just kind of are you self-censoring or inhibited in any way? But, you know, do you know anybody who's inhibited in any way? And the findings were so striking in terms of people self-reporting that it almost didn't matter what they said about their friends because they were uh, clear and direct enough about their own personal behavior. And obviously, their reporting on their personal behavior uh, is, is, is uh, more direct and more accurate. So 28% of writers told us they had curtailed or avoided social media activities as a result of concerns about surveillance, and another 12% have seriously considered doing so. 24%, so uh, very, very nearly one-fourth have avoided particular topics in phone or email conversations, and another 9% said they had seriously considered doing so. We also asked about surveillance and the impact on journalists' work uh, specifically, and we found uh, they were, not surprisingly, the most impacted. 14% saying they're taking extra precautions to protect the anonymity of sources, and 3% saying they've declined, they've declined opportunities to meet either physically or electronically with sources who might be deemed security threats by the government. We asked people, all right, if you are self-censoring, what kinds of topics have you been writing about that make you think you might come under scrutiny? And uh, here were some of the answers. Military affairs, uh, the MENA region, Mass incarceration, drug policy, pornography, the Occupy movement, uh, and other topics that could entail criticism of the US government. The report got a lot of press 
coverage, uh, I think people did find it surprising. And the reactions were mixed. Uh, some people came out and said, uh, these writers are cowards. You know, what's wrong with them? Uh, they're paranoid. You know, we live in the United States. There's nothing to fear. Uh, they're, they're inflated with a false sense of self-importance. Uh, but even that sort of, it generated debate. Uh, and, and our point um, in talking to the press about this is uh, there are a whole spectrum of writers represented here. And I think Jana will talk about this some more. We didn't really uh, do a detailed breakdown on things like ethnicity or immigration status, but where we did ask people uh, to offer free-form comments, what we found was there's an interplay between mass surveillance and targeted surveillance. So people who are part of a group that may have been or, uh, or, or, or be concerned about being the subject of targeted surveillance, so Muslim Americans, people with uncertain immigration status, members of other minority groups, uh, people who've been part of movements or reporting or publications that attract political scrutiny, they're the most likely to be worried about mass surveillance, probably not surprisingly. Uh, we use this report to make the point that in addition to implicating, of course, Fourth Amendment search and seizure and privacy concerns, that there's a direct impact of surveillance on core American values of free expression. And that if our writers are being harmed, we're all losing out because we're missing the pieces and subjects and topics and books that now some writers are fearful of writing about, and that that's a loss for all of us. Uh, we have uh, a, a game plan and a work plan this year to undertake, undertake further research. We want to reveal more detail about the kinds of concerns writers have, the kinds of behaviors they're engaging in here in the US, and also, also to survey writers around the world to see the impact of these revelations, uh, not just here at home, but globally. So with that, I'll turn it over to Yana. Well, thank you. Um, yeah, I'm a fiction writer, so I come at it from a different angle. Um, and I have not worked on surveillance before, um, quite recently. Um, but of course, with something being new, this is what's going on. And probably I had thought, since I have many Muslim friends and many activist friends, I had initially thought these things we shouldn't write in emails, but then we spoke about them on the phone. Uh, thinking that's safe, um, and since I've always worked a lot on political issues before becoming a full-time writer, I worked with the United Nations and while I was in Africa on um, crisis and um, peacekeeping. So I am quite aware of human rights issues uh, also in this field and was worried, but didn't quite know how to go about doing anything. Then in June last year, yeah, shortly after the, the Snowden revelations first came out, uh, a German writer, Judith C., she wrote a letter to Angela Merkel asking Merkel to take um, some stand on the issue. And of course, she got no, got no response. It was an open letter, and then it was signed by a number of other writers. And it had like no impact except a bit of press coverage. And she amassed um, public signatures, 75,000, and a couple of months later carried those to the council's office. I still had no response uh, through press pictures and that, basically. And I thought, well, uh, though I live in New York, I am from Denmark, and you're always, I think, more established in your own country politically also, so I thought maybe I want to do something in Denmark similarly. And then it seems so silly to do something in a small country of five million people, and you know, there won't be anything in this world, nobody will even notice. And then, then what happened was that Ilya Troyanov, a um, German-Bulgarian writer who lives in Vienna, he was suddenly denied access to, into the US. He has been teaching in the US before. Uh, his family actually had fled communism in Bulgaria, the old enemy, <laughs> uh, when he was a child. And, uh, but he had been writing over the summer a couple of articles against the NSA and surveillance. And suddenly, twice, he was denied access, and at the time, you know, boarding the plane. Um, so, uh, since he's a friend of mine, we communicated a bit, and, uh, also, and I thought, we, we need a worldwide movement doing something. And somehow, 
Yeah, it grew out of just a few of us being yeah, concerned. Um, and there were three other writers, one actually an American translator, Isabel Fager Cole, who lives in Berlin also. Um, and Priya Basile, a British Indian Kenyan writer, very mixed uh, also. Um, and then Joseph Hasslinger, an Austrian writer who's a member of Penn International, uh, or Roman Penn International in Austria. And by email, actually, we did most of the work. We thought, yeah, what, what do we do to address this international? We had some discussion about what, what can we even do. And we decided to write an appeal uh, that we should then publish worldwide. And we started contacting first writers that we knew and there would be a willing and interested in signing up. And we sounded out and sounded people were interested. And then we formulated this appeal. Uh, we maybe I'll read part of it in, in just a moment. And it took us a long time, more than we think, to formulate a one-page appeal. Because once we started, we also thought, if we have to write something that will hold water. Uh, also, over the longer term, really, what are the principles involved here? Because our concern was very much, I mean, it was not actually as writers, it was only we realized that as writers we might see and understand before many other people what surveillance do. Because we live all the time in imagined worlds. Um, and we also work, you know, I think many of us, with different societies, working on you know, autocratic societies and uh, looking at what's happening there. Ilya himself yeah, has, of course, direct experience from Eastern Europe. All the German writers know very well what happened in the DDR. But I think also for the rest of us, this idea that somebody can read along, basically, with what you write, and can keep an eye on everything you do, and how, as a human being, it inhibits you, and makes you, in a way, want, even instinctively, to conform to something you think will not put you in danger. Because all human beings try uh, to stay safe, so, since we don't know what all these different authorities and companies who amass the information will either do with it, and also which things that they might consider so-called wrong in the future, that will make us conform to something we don't even quite know what is. So it will just be anything that is out of the standard norm of what everybody else does, which makes us really quite boring, but also um, limits us in many ways um, and I think generally it would stop people doing a lot of political activities, a lot of activism, these are the evident dangerous things, but also personally, because if, power, if knowledge is power, those who have knowledge over you have power over you. And even, you know, this argument people say, oh, but I don't do anything wrong, but everybody above the age of six, I'm sure, has things they prefer to keep private, than to tell everybody. And once somebody knows these things and have it, they will be able either, you know, to flag maybe one way or the other, or you might, as I say, even do it yourself because you don't want to put yourself in a position. So, so for me, that was very much this concern of what does it do to each one of us and therefore to a society. If you were here, he would tell you how it influenced you know, Eastern Europe, how people you know, you don't trust each other, you don't trust each other within a family. And it's actually not that huge an apparatus that's needed for that. It's just the fear that this might happen. Your family might be under surveillance. Now we actually happen to know that we all are under surveillance, but we will think a lot of people will think at least, well, but they're not focusing on me, so I'm not in any kind of particular danger. Um, but the thing is, we never know what we do, what check our shirt, or color of hair, or, or opinion will be the one that might focus on you, or when you have the friend who is a friend or has the same name of somebody who's on some terror list. Um, and then suddenly they'll start looking at it, and they'll know everything. They'll know where you were. If you just carry a normal mobile phone, they'll know where you were every single second. Um, and I'm sure, again, that you have just something you don't want all your neighbors to know. So anyway, we, we formulated this, um, and I think now I'll, I'll read it, because that's kind of the core of what, what we went for, um, and what we will somehow still go fighting on. 
Um, I'm not reading it, John, because I think everybody knows a bit what is going on here. The basic pillar of democracy is the inviolable integrity of the individual. Human integrity extends beyond the physical body. In their thoughts and in their personal environment and communications, all humans have the right to remain unobserved and unmolested. This fundamental human right has been rendered null and void through abuse of technological developments by states and corporations for mass surveillance purposes. A person under surveillance is no longer free. A society under surveillance is no longer a democracy. To maintain any validity, our democratic rights must apply in virtual as in real space. And then we have some principles yeah, obvious what else to say. Surveillance violates the private sphere of com and compromises freedom of thought and opinion. Mass surveillance treats every citizen as a potential suspect. It overturns one of our historical triumphs with presumption of innocence. Surveillance makes the individual transparent, while the state and the corporation operate in secret. As we've seen, this power is being systematically abused. Uh, and, and this is, of course, also linked to that normally the people are supposed in democracies to control their governments. That's what the whole thing is about. But suddenly, with mass surveillance, it's turned the other way around. We have no control over them. They have full control over us. Surveillance is theft. This data is not public property. It belongs to us. When it is used to predict our behavior, we are robbed of something else, the principle of free will crucial to democratic liberty. And then we have our demands um, that might be huge, but we thought we had to make them as ideal demands for how we would like it to be if we could. We demand the right for all people to determine as democratic citizens to what extent their personal data may be legally collected, stored, and processed, and by whom. To obtain information on where their data is stored and how it is being used, to obtain the deletion of the data if it has been legally collected and stored. We call on all states and corporations to respect these rights. We call on all citizens to stand up and defend these rights. We call on the United Nations to acknowledge the central importance of protecting civil rights in the digital age and to create an international bill of digital rights. We call on governments to sign and adhere to such a convention. Um, and yeah, once we had uh, appeal, um, we managed to get it signed by, I think it was 562 authors from 83 different countries. Um, we had five Nobel Prize um, laureates on the list, and we got one more later, Nadine Gordimar, and her name later. And I must say, most people we contacted said that they were very happy to sign, they were just glad somebody did something. And um, we got only a few notes. There were people we just couldn't reach. So the sign that somebody's not on the list does not necessarily mean that they didn't want to. But, um, but we got a few notes. And as uh, Susanna mentioned before, it was interesting that we had a fall in some categories because it was evident anybody from any minority, uh, whatever, um, young black women in America, gay people, people from countries, for living under autocratic regimes, they were immediately, yes, we want to sign this, we're going to fight, what do you need us to do? Uh, Russian uh, dissenters, uh, all were like that. It was the way we got the nose, the few we got, they were all white men. And my conclusion was that some of them simply have never been in a situation where that they can imagine what it is to be under suspicion. And, and wrongfully under suspicion. So they'll only say, well, people who have a problem with this are only because they've done something wrong. And so, so that's where they're coming from. So it takes much longer for them to imagine. I still had hope fiction writers <laughs> no, could imagine this, but it took anyway. But it was just quite interesting um, that it was so absolutely clear. Um, and there was one thing that we thought we would have problems with also here in America, uh, because I mean, I myself uh, definitely a supporter in general of, of Obama, and some people would, you know, did see, and we thought would see it, 
as something I put on the card, his uh, position here. Um, but, you know, I, you know, where I had to argue, I used the argument to say, listen, I think we are helping him. Because considering his position in, in politics before he became president, this surveillance would be against everything he stands for. And I can only imagine that he is running a government that um, carries through this kind of surveillance because it's out of his control. That the secret services, the hawks, the defense industry are so much bigger in power than he is. I think he can do certain things on he is now, but it's it is bigger than than most of the governments unfortunately that are involved. They opened a Pandora's box with some of their terror laws. And I think they are not quite sure how to close it again. And they have also created so much fear in populations that whenever one of these agencies say the word terror, they get another bag of money. So anyone, politician or private citizen, who raises their voice and says, we need to rein this in, will seem as if they put populations at risk. So somehow, Governments, and that also includes President Obama, I think have put themselves in a catch-22 where they can no longer stop this. So appeals like this, again, I think we can argue that they actually help at least any government who wants to be democratic. If they don't want it, we can't help them much. But um, it's a way of helping trying to say we have to regain democratic powers over our secret services. It's out of um, and the way we are going now, just to end this, is we hope to take it to the UN, if not a lot has happened before then, so it becomes unnecessary, um, and again push it onto the agenda as much as we can, because that's what we feel we can as independent writers. We don't know the nitty gritty of the issues, probably all of you here would know more than, than we do, um, but we can help put it on the political agenda. And also say that this is worldwide. It's not one country or another. And also the reason we don't talk about the US here is that even though it's not come out right now, we are quite sure all the European governments are also equally involved. My own little country is in the I-9 group. We are very good friends with uh, the NSA. But it's evident the reason the European governments have not been stronger out against what's going on is they're all in on it. And we have our own, and where we don't have our own, we borrow information from better sources, yeah. Um, so I think I will end here, I just say. Yeah. Thanks so much. I mean, the three fascinating um, presentations. I know a lot of questions about where we can go with this and next steps, but I'd love to open it to the floor if, if you have some questions. Or comments. Or comments. Or opinions. Mm -hmm. No. I'm interested in yeah. the, um, you sort of talking about this sort of political and advocacy work that you can do. But I think the one thing that's really interesting, I recently read Dave Eggers' new book, The Stirs Walk. It's not my favourite of his books, but it made me feel, you know, there's a lot in there about, it's about sort of corporate technology and how to, from, you know, sort of a new form of social media. <coughs> and I felt after I just wanted to log off everything and go sit under a tree. It had a really visceral had a really strong reaction to it. So I think it's interesting to think about how fiction writers can tell these stories using their gifts as writers, as well as advocates, but in a less literal kind of lobbying sense and in a, and in a storytelling sense, because I think that's kind of what we need. We need, the we need the firing the imaginations of us as a population that helps us understand. We can understand the technical aspects and the journalists are telling great, doing great reporting and I'm not saying it's either or. But the narratives, I think, are really powerful. And I think the more people that are beautifully writing those stories, yeah. the more powerful the community response. Because in Australia, where I come from, there's a complacency that you kind of want to cut through. And I'm wondering which writers can do that for us. It's true. Really he, yeah. Well, he actually wrote a piece, um, Dave, about the Penn survey that was published in The Guardian. I don't know if some of you saw it, but it was a great piece yeah. uh, You know, that I think did just that, I think one of the challenges with the NSA revelations is uh, that we haven't really seen the human face of this. I mean, other than the heads of state, I think, frankly, I put that in a different category because I think we all really knew that was happening 
at some level, and that it was mutual. And so the revelation that Merkel's phone is tapped, sort of shocking at one level, but not really. You know, maybe that you know you would have thought they would have other means, but somehow, you know, we knew there there was a lot of scrutiny uh, and a lot of spying. Um, what we have not heard about is the ordinary person, you know, who sort of got caught up in the dragnet. I mean, Ilya Trojanov's case is, is mysterious. This man, uh, writer, stopped at the border, uh, blocked from getting on his plane uh, in, in, in Rio to come to the United States, who had been involved in these anti-surveillance activities. Uh, you know, I don't think we've gotten to the bottom yet of what that was about. Uh, and we don't really have yet the other stories, and I agree with you, that's a missing piece of what, what uh, of, of a potentially very powerful narrative. Yeah. And I know it takes time. Like, yeah. it's not, you know, you can't rush. Exactly, because think that there's also the problem, you can do crime stories often about something very, you know, pertinent political issue. If you want to do the kind of literature that speaks to the soul and goes deeper, it takes much longer. But then on the other hand, as uh, Adam said, since surveillance has been around for so long, I mean, now I can't think off the cuff, but there will be literature that deals with this thing of being constantly on in, in a sense, Kafka's the castle, where you have a person dealing with authorities that are not trustworthy in any way, yeah. And he can't figure out what's going on. What that does to you is actually quite well described. I guess part of it is really intriguing because I'm not suggesting you have to be literal about, you know, this sort of contextual to what's happening. There's something to do is still about those central themes. So it doesn't, it can be historical, yeah. it doesn't have to be contemporary, but I guess it's about introducing those voices again yeah. in a way. Without, I think people switch off a little bit when you say, read 1984 again. Like, I don't know that that's the end. Yeah, yeah no, but it's, I think it's clear that we have to go back to what it does to us as individuals. Because mm. uh, so essential, this thing of this slight cutting off of the edges of yourself. And I'm, I'm sure most people today in the world already does that. In all our democratic countries, so it, people are very safe. It does happen. Like you say, even with writers, that then there are you know people that they don't dare to interview, or you know friends they don't communicate with, and they are normally people who are pretty courageous because you know they use their voices, and I think normal people do. There are people you don't want to be friends with because suddenly it can be come tricky. We have changed the world over the last ten years. It's become you know, somehow not a trustworthy place. Um, and these revelations just show yeah, exactly how much is around. Um, and I must just comment that um, from, from our perspective at Penn International, um, I think you know, two things. One is that in terms of literature, it's always been science fiction that's mm -hmm. dealt with this issue. And it's, there's now this transition from science fiction to reality. And it's, it's, it's actually a fascinating moment in, in literature. And another thing is that we're really looking at this, that there's a need for a culture of engagement with surveillance. Um, you know, we, we were talking earlier about the beautiful German film, The Lives of Others, mm -hmm. and you know, that treatment of, of surveillance and the knowledge of surveillance and how that kind of impacts you. But, but what we're not seeing, I think what Dave Egger is, you know, kind of has, has begun maybe this new sort of treatment of, of surveillance. Um, Jory Graham has this beautiful poem out yeah. the moment on, on surveillance. We're, what we're hoping to do over the coming years is to really encourage maybe an anthology of writing and yeah. surveillance, poetry, mm -hmm. getting people just to, just to engage with it, not as, you know, I think it's sort of not like overtly the political, you mm -hmm. know, writings, of course, you know, essays are, are really fantastic, but I, I think sort of looking at this, particularly from a cultural point of view, is so important. It is what is this doing to our society. And, and, and it doesn't all have to be negative. No, there. no, it, it can be like fascinating. Yeah. Films and books coming yeah. out about our yeah. relation, changing relationships with technology. Exactly. By Jones and her, yeah. like yeah. 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 stuff that's coming out that really connects to that yeah. part of our, uh, the way we live our lives. Hi, um, I think it's really, I, it will take time to develop mm -hmm. more considered artistic responses mm -hmm. to what's happening, but I think what's so shocking about the Penn mm -hmm. survey is how immediate the, the chilling effect is, that it's not something that may happen in the future if this continues, or you know that it's happening already, and 
Um, my organization, the Committee to Protect Journalists, also did a report on the impact on journalists and journalism. And already, you know, mainstream journalists for well-established news organizations say they watch what they write, they can't talk to their sources, their sources have stopped returning their phone calls, like that there is already such a widespread effect, I think should be a cause for you know, greater alarm and public concern. But I think there is a surprising amount of complacency, but I hope that these kinds of reports help. I think they do, and they also help to bring it to new audiences. I think that's really yeah, I think, important. Well, I mean, I think another aspect to consider, I, mean, I think you're right, the immediacy of the fact it's very dramatic, but it's also, um, there's a sort of latent and very kind of subversive aspect to, you know, you touched on this, to how, you know, young journalists maybe now kind of thinking about their role. I mean, there's a, um, a speech that Orhan Pamuk gave, uh, and he sort of during a very difficult period in Turkey's history when he was a young writer, he, um, Penn had a delegation there uh, with Arthur Miller, and, and Pamuk was the translator for the delegation. Somebody interviewed him, and one of the questions was, what are all the topics that you're afraid to write about? And <laughs> Pamuk writes that he, well, here's the answer, though. He said he was embarrassed because he couldn't even think of what it was that he wasn't writing about. I mean, it becomes almost so ingrained uh, that you shape the parameters of your professional or artistic life around what you feel is safe, that you lose sight of what you're not writing about.